A very good morning to you all. Welcome to the online lecture series on English studies organized by the Department of English of Mahavidyalay. Today is the fourth lecture and lecture number four will be given by none other than Dr. Shubhadi Paul and he would be speaking on intimacy, inspection and identitarian politics in Salman Rushdie's The Free Radio. Now I'll formally introduce Dr. Shubhadi Paul. Dr. Shubhadi Paul is currently assistant professor in the Department of English, School of Literature, Language and Cultural Studies in Bankura University, West Bengal. He has previously taught at the PG Department of English in Maulana Ajat College, Kolkata, and was also a guest faculty at the PG Department of English in Lady Brebon College, Kolkata. He was a UGC JRF and SRF at Jadopur University. His MPhil was on a re-evaluation of diasporic sensibility in Indian expatriate literature. And his PhD was a critic of East-West cultural polarizations in Indian English fiction. He has co-edited Anxieties, Influences, and After Critical Responses to Postcolonialism and Neocolonialism, published by Worldview Publishers in association with Wimbledon Press UK in 2009. Finite Sketches, Infinite Reaches, his first book of poems received critical acclaim and was included in the annual bibliography issue on new writing from India, edited by Samala A. Narayanan in the Journal of Commonwealth Literature. He was co-director of a two-year major research project entitled Discoursing the Homeless, Elderly, Tropes, Desires, Containment, funded by ICSSR in collaboration with the University of Swansea, UK. His fictional and non-fictional writings have featured in Narrow Road Journal, Blue Minaret Literary Journal, The Four Quartets Magazine, North East Review, The Sunday Statesman, The Telegraph, Hindustan Times, and Luath Press, Edinburgh. It's indeed an honor and privilege to have you, sir. Welcome, the screen is yours. We hope to have an entertaining and engaging session ahead. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you and uh, my very best wishes to uh, Mir, Professor Mir Muhammad Ali for the invite. And uh, I would also like to extend my best wishes to uh, the president of the GB of your college, Mr. Topol Kumar Patanayak. And uh, I would also like to thank the honorable secretary, Dr. Hori Podo Mohapatro. And uh, I would also like to kind of, you know, extend my gratitude to uh, your entire department uh, for uh, asking me over to give a lecture, to deliver a lecture on uh, Salman Rushdie's The Free Radio. Now, uh, I have a very brief lecture, uh, so to say, because I, I'm trying to kind of, you know, uh, stick to the basics of uh, an undergraduate audience. Um, and uh, of course, the very first thing that comes to my mind is that whenever we think about uh, anything by Salman Rushdie, uh, we are uh, always a bit apprehensive uh, that it is going to be something very complex. And uh, at times it is indeed so that, you know, there are multiple layers of uh, complexity involved in the whole thing. Now, uh, of course, uh, there is a very interesting prelude to this as well, because uh, uh, East West, uh, which is, uh, you know, the collection from which this story is taken, uh, was also part of my PhD dissertation. So uh, it was a sort of a revisiting uh, of uh, the entire, you know, uh, series of stories uh, that are there, in which, of course, the free radio is an important part. Um, I would like to begin with a quotation, and I would like to point out to my audience that perhaps this particular uh, section of the story is uh, what is you know, going to lead to uh, a key understanding of the entire text. 
and I quote, we all knew nothing good will, would happen to him while the thief's widow had her claws dug into his flesh. But the boy was an innocent, a real donkey's child. You can't teach such people. Now, I feel that the gist of the entire story is perhaps explained in this line, because uh, we are talking about a young, presumably handsome, uh, you know, uh, rickshaw puller called Ramani. That name is also very significant. And he had uh, inherited the rickshaw from his father. So most possibly that's the only inheritance that he can possibly be proud of. And uh, his uh, liaison with uh, this unnamed woman, who is basically referred to as the thief's widow, which is uh, also a very you know uh, sardonic way of uh, referring to someone, the first uh, name or the primary name, uh, the primary noun is absent. It's deliberately left, uh, you know, unmentioned. And their so-called uh, love story, which kind of, you know, earns the censure uh, of the narrator. The narrator's name, once again, we are not told, but we are told that he is, uh, he is uh, a retired, uh, you know, school teacher with, uh, you know, uh, having some very fixed views uh, about life and living. And through which, you know, uh, this, this, the, the, the entire filtration of the story is uh, carried forward. Now, um, there are some issues that I'd like to just uh, briefly gloss over. And, and the first thing is the fact that Ramani is a bachelor. He is a young man. He is 10 years uh, younger than uh, the woman. The woman is also young, so to say. Uh, she's a young widow. And uh, most important thing is this, that she's the mother of five. And uh, there is a slur of prostitution which is put on her, perhaps a little unjustifiably, majorly unjustifiably. And uh, the issue, the historical, the, the, the cultural historical context of nasbandi or uh, vasectomy, as we understand it, uh, the imperatives behind that. So I, I would like to kind of, you know, just gloss over the cultural politics that are associated with the very idea of intimacy uh, from an Indian standpoint. Uh, the, the culture of surveillance that happens to, you know, proliferate, if we at all treat the story as, you know, having the basic nuances of Indianness uh, that is so, uh, you know, uh, prolific in, in, in some of Rushdie's writings. Um, the idea of censorship and shame. Uh, and of course, how all of this, you know, basically uh, constitutes uh, the sense of an identity. What is the right identity? What is the identity to be proud of? What is the identity to uh, not, uh, you know, carry forward in the public domain, so on and so forth. Now, uh, let us uh, keep one thing in mind, and that is this, that East West was released in 1994. And by this time, you know, Rushdie had already uh, achieved the high point of his career. So, you know, most of the major novels like uh, Midnight's Children, Grimus, Shame, they had, they had already been published by this time. And this work was preceded by um, a work called Harun and the Sea of Stories. So, by this time, the fatwa, uh, the debacles that led uh, to the publication of the satanic verses, uh, these things were, you know, already history by this time. So uh, the idea of, you know, uh, freedom, individual freedom, and the agencies or the issues that lead to a sensorial attitude, that lead to the curbing of those, you know, individual freedoms, which is a very hot topic of uh, debate even today. Uh, is something which is uh, very much uh, unmistakably present in this uh, collection of stories. And this was also, you know, kind of succeeded by the Moore's Last Sigh in 1995. So uh, there again, we find the issues of, you know, uh, uh, hybrid identities, the, the, the biryanification and chutneyfication of identities. Uh, and uh, also, uh, I think, uh, the uh, issues related to uh, what we know as the mongrelized uh, identities, very 
mixed up, you know, cut and mix identities which are there. So uh, the the sense of you know cultural uh, uprightness or propriety or a monodimensional view of things uh, is something which is uh, you know a uh, bit castigated uh, even in 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 these uh, you know uh, works, uh, so to say. Now the the idea of Nazbandi once again was uh, a measure of the uh, Congress government at that point of time. and we all know that uh, during the emergency period which is also the backdrop of this uh, you know uh, collection of stories uh, that was between 1975 to 77 21 month of you know emergency declared by the president fakhruddin ali ahmed largely by due to the coaxings of uh, the then prime minister uh, indira gandhi but then uh, at that point of time as we all know uh, that her elder son Uh, who was still alive uh, sanjay gandhi had a major say uh, of uh, cultural and political decisions so uh, the the drive to vasectomy was basically aimed at uh, you know uh, what should i say uh, curbing the, uh, the the menace of overpopulation and uh, when uh, the emergency was sanctioned uh, with the help of article 352 uh then i think that this was also a so, sort of state interference in in public uh matters or or private matters uh, which was not always looked very favorably by the rural population the population who were you know uh, basically still lacking in uh, proper education and scientific know how about things they had superstitions they had the belief that uh, Uh, you know uh, vasectomy would be affecting their libido or uh, their virility and so on and so forth so this is a very you know interesting story that kind of you know uh, throws light on the serio comical patterns of our existence you know it it is it is it's basically very serious uh, at at many different levels and uh, the treatment and everything is also very comical and what i find uh, quite interesting is the fact that uh, uh you know uh, the story is not re- really all all through and through told in a very complex manner the the way you usually have with rashdiite sentences and sentence constructions it, it it's basically told uh, from uh, the 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 perspective of the simple folk uh, so to say and uh, i would also uh, like to point out the fact that uh, there are interesting uh, turns and phrases like uh the lady asks the school teacher to stop spreading his cobra poison you know that's a very interesting uh turn of phrase because uh this 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 ideal of gossiping and gossip mongering and uh you know backstage uh, uh character assassinations these are very common in the uh you know lower middle class uh, and even in the upper middle class you know uh, subaltern and bourgeois circles uh so so i think that uh, uh the 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 very vantage point of telling the story uh has this very postmodernist strategy of unreliable narration and the narrator is also largely unreliable for for many different ways um and and we have to uh, you know come to terms with that uh, so there is a single story but at the same time there are multiple you know uh trajectories of approach to that story so so there are multiple planes of narrative which uh, remain uh, you know uh, largely uh, sometimes uh, overt and sometimes covert now there are many issues that i would just like to very uh, briefly gloss over and and the first thing is this that uh, you should not approach the story from an interpretative standpoint you know like it's a good idea to approach the story from uh a very uh you know holistic self questioning standpoint what do i mean by that what i basically mean is this that let us pick up the information that uh rashti has provided us with okay and uh what do we get to see because of that uh what we get to see is 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 something very very interesting and i would like to uh point it out to you uh, one by one the first is the standpoint of prejudice that we find in the story uh because the narrator has uh, had already you know approached the story from a very prejudiced angle okay 
and uh, i feel that this uh, prejudicial approach uh, is sustained uh, through and through uh, you know towards the woman in particular now uh, there are some questions that i will uh, throw to you questions which would be in a way you know rhetorical questions and uh, questions which would also kind of perhaps you know uh, throw light on the uh, uh, the the uh, nature of the text itself you know how we can deal with it what are the uh, terms and conditions by which we can explain it so on and so forth so uh, in the very first instance let me come to this uh, very major you know uh, idea which is this that the trope of the young widow uh, i feel this is of course a personal opinion um, others might uh, also disagree with this and the idea is this that uh, the trope of the young widow had always been a problematic that uh, was never uh, fully addressed you know that's that's my personal opinion that was never fully addressed and uh, we have found in the case of you know many of tagore's female characters that uh, this is also perhaps oxymoronic in the sense that uh, youth and widowhood perhaps do not go together but this is also a very heteropatriarchal standpoint that women should be uh, judged uh, from the point of view of the identities of their husbands you know this is something that uh, uh, i think rashdi perhaps tries to uh, criticize uh, in, in in a major way and uh, the woman's husband is uh, said to be a deceased thief okay so her present identity is predicated on the identity of her husband okay now what do i mean by that what i basically mean is that the narrator puts charges uh, on her that what have you done in life other than maybe uh, you know uh, indulging in thieving with your husband uh, uh, and producing babies that's the only thing that you have done in life and so you are not really deserved of a man like raman you know once again uh, this is set in a very tightly knit uh, cultural community in india which is uh, left unsaid where it is but i have this uh, feeling and, and and this is also part of a, a hermeneutical reading of the text that uh, in the name ramani i also find the name ram okay and uh, the narrator also addresses ramani uh, a couple of times as ram you know maybe that's that's a short way of addressing him and uh, ram what have you done ram what is, what are you doing this is this is highly inappropriate on your part and uh, i feel that uh, the woman whoever she is she fails to be a sita okay that's that's the standpoint that she is no uh, ideal woman she is no uh, sati savitri damayanti types uh, that is being uh, perhaps expected by this rather prejudiced uh, school teacher retired school teacher now uh, of course the entire rhetoric of uh, personality assessment is being done by the school teacher and mind you in villages or in uh, semi rural areas teachers have a major say uh, in everything so uh the opinion of a teacher is very much valued in uh in the context of uh you know uh, analysis and evaluations of different things and yet we find that uh the teacher does not really have a very humanitarian egalitarian approach to the state of things you know especially towards this woman I and mean, he he has uh, i wouldn't be wrong in saying this a very 
misogynistic uh, approach to the analysis of a woman's identity. I wouldn't say analysis of character because uh, once again, you know, that is a very subjective thing. And uh, as we all know, character certificates are basically untrue uh, in every walk of life. So, so th 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 that's really not something which uh, will be holding much water. But anyway, my point is this, that uh, uh, the school teacher uh, does not find the woman to be appetizing enough in the context of a man as good as Raman, especially given the point that uh, he had known his parents so well. This is, this is, of course, what we hear in the context of the narration, that he was on very good terms with Ramani's parents. Okay? Uh, so uh, there is the voice of guardianship uh, in, in, in the story that one ought to listen to one's guardians. Okay? And the guardians are the custodians of truth. Okay? Especially your teachers. You have to listen to what you teachers are saying. Now, uh, there's no denying that your te teachers are perhaps trying to give you instruction in many different ways, and you should be uh, following that. But uh, it is not always necessary that the moral instruction or uh, the kind of you know, uh, standpoint of conventional uh, so sociocultural practices that are being advocated in one age need be necessarily carried forward to the next age. So there is uh, also an intergenerational uh, clash of ideas that I also find, which is very natural, because uh, I think that that happens uh, between every uh, successive generations. Uh, but uh, if I might also question that uh, Sita, uh, or for that matter, Shakuntala, despite being so virtuous, upright, and not really having uh, any uh, deviance on their own accord, were they spared from the punishments of patriarchy? They were not. So uh, this woman, uh, of course, her, uh, the very construct of her identity is something that leads to judgments, you know, leads to uh, evaluations which are perhaps not right, but they are necessarily made in this context. Now, uh, what is uh, important is this, that we also find that insinuating remarks are passed against her. Not only that uh, there is a charge of, you know, uh, uh, alleged prostitution and all that, and that's where she gets the money. Now, after the husband's death, that's what she does. So uh, she is disreputable and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, once again, uh, sex work is not seen as honorable. Uh, sex work is not even seen as work at all, you know, like uh, that way. And uh, the other factor is this, that uh, there is no uh, ascertaining of proof that she uh, kind of, you know, uh, participates in this uh, trade or activity. And she is viewed as the unfortunate cow with a lot of calves, you know. Uh, so, so there is no man. Uh, who would find her a desirable uh, agent for, uh, or, or a de desirable agency uh, in the marriage market. So, so that's what is very interesting, that uh, she is somebody who is relegated to the background. And uh, a school teacher, mind you, of all people, we are not talking about, uh, you know, um, small traders or you know, uh, truck drivers or uh, even, you know, laborers passing remarks. We are talking about a school teacher who is passing uh, a remark uh, about a woman and um, uh, or a series of remarks uh, on a woman. And especially so when India has had uh, a very strong uh, history or heritage uh, of uh, widow remarriage, uh, you know, female education, and so on and so forth. So, having said all of this, uh, let me come to the bottom line. And the bottom line is this, that we are perhaps uh, above everything else and beyond everything else, we are talking about education. 
and we are not just talking about any education we are talking about the right kind of education uh, the education which is not just the attainment of degrees uh, in, in pen and paper but the education which actually makes us good individuals and is that education uh, an inborn quality or uh, do we pick it up uh, from our environment as well and if that be the case then i find the uh, personality or uh, the attitudes uh, or the thought processes of ramani to be far more progressive than the uh, thought processes of the school teacher uh, of course uh, there are several you know uh, loose ends that we need to tie up uh, and and there are several questions that come out of the questions that are already thrown uh, so so there is a, a polyphonic discourse uh, made available and the text is definitely very strongly heteroglossic in in many different ways and the questions that come up is this that uh, why is her husband dead so was he beaten up or did he suffer an illness was he an alcoholic uh, there are several questions that are there but one thing is which is very clear is this that uh, he had five children so there was no uh, uh, belief uh, in contraception uh, there was no uh, family planning involved in everything and uh, more the most important thing is that even if uh, she is like this even if the woman has five children uh, let, let's take it for granted the children are all uh, born on this uh, soil born in this country so uh, what is uh, the social insurance of this family where uh, the man of the family so to say uh, is dead and deceased uh, so what is the social insurance that the widow and her children are getting what kind of employability uh, will uh, they look forward to if they do not have uh, you know proper education or certificates or they have not learned a proper trade how are they going to feed themselves these questions are not uh, really answered by the school teacher it is as if that you are a fringe product and you should be fringed uh, to the borders you know like you have no right to live in mainstream society so there is a, a practice of excommunication there is a tendency to excommunicate this woman uh, a tendency to ostracize her uh, a tendency to kind of even uh, erase her basic uh, you know social identity and uh, existence in the very first place and the most important thing is uh, this is also a, a very typical uh, let's call it a pan indian uh, attitude that we are always uh, predicated our identities are always predicated by our uh, circumstantial situations so what kind of job we do what kind of lifestyles we lead what kind of people are we associated with uh, what kind of family do we come from so everything has to pass through a sieve of judgment you know our individual choices our individual natures our individual decisions they are not uh, valued so uh, this is a very you know um, a, a very hypercritical situation where individualism is given a total discount and and that is very very sad uh, that that's what i feel Uh, look at this particular line the widow was certainly attractive no point denying in a sort of a hard vicious way she was all right but it uh, was a mentality that was rotten look at this last line the uh, last part of this line but it was her mentality that was rotten such a very uh, ironical line i should say because uh, uh, it, it it actually uh throws up the identity of the speaker itself uh it it actually uh, kind of you know shows his prejudice uh while he is trying to blame others as prejudiced in 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 that manner and uh i think that uh, you know this very idea of shame 
you know, like uh, th there is a saying that um, perhaps we criticize uh, those things in others the most, the things that, that are there in ourselves the most, you know, like that's how hatred is, is predicated because uh, hatred is also just the coin opposite of love. Uh, it's, it's the other dimension. So perhaps we recognize the possibility, the latent possibility of that emotion in us. And, and that is why we tend to have uh, attitudes of, uh, uh, you know, uh, cynicism uh, and, and all kinds of, you know, uh, attitudes like racism and xenophobia and gender discrimination and so on. Uh, they, they basically come from this very idea of living in a culture of shame which is very, very detestable, you know, like, because uh, the, the very idea of, you know, having shame as a marker of assertion is a problematic which is never fully resolved. So you can pass the shame from the man to the woman, you can pass the shame from the man to the woman, uh, and you can keep doing innumerable number of permutations and combinations with shame. But the basic fact is this, that shame remains. And as long as it remains uh, as a, a kind of, you know, germination in society, it basically gets transferred from one agent to another. So uh, that is something I think uh, Salman Rushdie also addressed in a certain way in his novel, uh, Shame, that, you know, uh, sharam, uh, so to say, um, is, is also something that is highly uh, 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 abominable in, in many ways. I'm not sure about this, but uh, I think in uh, Urdu or in uh, Islamic history, uh, I have uh, you know uh, come to know about this that uh, the uh, female uh, sexual uh, organ or the womb, in that sense, is uh, known as the sharam ga, uh, which which basically means the tunnel of shame. Uh, that, that, that is a very pejorative way of uh, uh, defining. Uh, anatomical, uh, you know, uh, aspects. But, but look at this very idea that why should uh, the female anatomy be uh, defined by the very, you know, constitutive markers of shame? As if like the very presence of the female anatomy is shameful. And, and that needs to be persistently reminded of that even when you are indulging in sex, for uh, procreative reasons, leave alone recreative reasons, then you are basically indulging in something shameful. You are indulging in something sinful. And, and that is a, a legacy, perhaps. I, I don't know we have uh, been uh, products of uh, you know, uh, foreign invasions and, and colonial rules for a very long time. So, so it, it might have uh, something to do with, uh, you know, the, the, the British rule in India or the Mughal rule in India. I'm not going into all that, you know, cultural religious debates. But what I'm basically trying to tell you is this, that this is a universal problem uh, in the Indian context. And, and uh, we live with this, uh, you know, th this culture of shame uh, that actually alienates us uh, from, some, from one another. And, and instead of making lives better for everyone, it, it, it makes life worse for everyone. It actually distances people. But anyway, uh, there is this didacticism and preachiness in the school teacher, which goes unab unabated. And then I come to this, uh, this, this whole idea about uh, what happens when Ramani tells him that you are wrong. I'm not selling my manhood to this woman. Uh, basically, what I'm doing is I'm in love with her. And I would like to spend my life with her. So uh, uh, I'm just trying to make adjustments to make that happen. And the school teacher cannot refrain from going out uh, and having a talk with the thief's widow and telling her that, what are you doing? Spare the life of this young man. You are this lusty old widow and you, you should be just out of the picture. And I, I'm, I'm pretty much sure that you have seen in the case of, you know, English literature as well. You've seen in the case of the Duchess of Malfi and other texts that uh, lust and widowhood, uh, once again, youth and widowhood are not really predicated on the same line. So there is a, a kind of, you know, uh, 
uh, very uh, hypercritical stance on uh, the mobilization of sexual energy of the female. And uh, I feel that uh, the woman then, of course, tells him that, uh, look here, uh, Master Sahib, that's the way you know, she addresses him. And then she adds the word retired. So yes, you have a social position. People respect you. Uh, people respect you even now uh, because you are the, the uh, flag bearer of respectability. Uh, so uh, of course, uh, you have that social position that perhaps I do not have. But uh, at the same time, please mind you that you are no longer in active service. So you are retired. And for by no means are you my teacher uh, directly. So I'm an adult woman. I know what to do. And let me inform you that uh, it is not I who proposition uh, Ramani for a life together. It is he who proposed to me. Uh, and I said no. Because uh, marriage involves procreation. And I do not want any more children. That, that's, that's something that comes from her. And for the first time in the text, we find the woman speaking. You know, the woman speaking uh, or, or her words are, you know, uh, kind of let over to the other side of the reader. Uh, that she is uh, speaking in terms of uh, decision making. Uh, that uh, I don't want to marry him because I know that uh, I have some limitations. You know, I'm, I'm no longer a spinster. I'm a widow. I have mouths to feed. I have five children. Uh, perhaps the sad legacy that my husband has left for me. Uh, he has left me no social insurance, but he has left me with a lot of responsibility. So I cannot shirk away from my responsibility. That's something that you have to uh, keep in mind. And at the same time, uh, the school teacher gets a little flabbergasted uh, by these remarks that, uh, of course, then perhaps there is another side to the story that uh, he has uh, perhaps missed out. Uh, and yet his prejudice does not go away. He feels that she is only cooking up a story to remain safe. Uh, and uh, you basically want to kind of, you know, shift the burden of your responsibility, social responsibility to Ramani. And there is this uh, mock image of Ramani pulling the rickshaw and the woman and the five children on the back, including two deceased children, which could not take uh, you know, a proper shape or did not have a proper birth. Uh, so, so yes, there is this, uh, this uh, scientific precision in the story. There is this uh, social need to... Uh, regulate population. I'm not saying to stop population growth. Uh, I, I'm not saying, uh, uh, and many people have this idea that vasectomy is castration, which of course it isn't. And, and that is what uh, Ramani tells, uh, uh, you know, uh, the school teacher, that uh, everything remains the same. So I uh, love a woman. I want to spend my time and my life with her. And uh, we want to have uh, all the you know bliss that comes with domesticity and conjugality, but it's just that we do not want any more children because there is absolutely no necessity. Uh, and uh, he decides to make this uh, adjustment. I will not call it a compromise because ha not having children is not really a big failure in life. You know, like in in our cultures, we have this tendency of criticizing people who don't have children. That uh, well, you have been married for one year, two year, three year, four year, five years. When will we hear the good news and all that? So th there is a lot of these uh, unnecessary social pressures which are uh, put on both men and women. You know, like and and if there is a, a failure to procreate, that is almost a, a, a failure of your sexuality uh, and even a kind of you know limitation on your identity uh, because the. The, the first measure of your heterosexuality is your marriage marker itself, that you marry because you are a heterosexual, else you wouldn't have married. So there is a homophobia involved in this idea as well. And, and the second uh, phobia that comes with it is, is, is not having children. So uh, this, this very idea that people might uh, consciously and uh, you know, through the exercise of their self-decision not have children 
is something that does not get into the head of uh, most people. What will people say? You know, that, that's the question. How will we answer our friends? You will find that when you don't do something in life, like let's say you don't marry at a time when elders want you to, or you don't have children when the elders want you to. Uh, it's the elders who are always in the panicky situation, you know, in the panic mode. Uh, and, and when you have them, uh, like let's say you have children, you will find the elders run away. So <laughs> you will find that uh, ultimately it's your responsibility and you will have to take care of your marriage or your children or your domesticity, your EMIs and your everything. Nobody will be there for you at that point of time. So uh, this is a, a kind of, you know, a, a kind of a mutual decision that, that Ramani and uh, the young widow come to, his, his new wife, uh, he then marries her. Uh, and and uh, they decide uh, that vasectomy would be a good uh, idea because uh, it would fall, every, it, it would make everything fall in one particular line. You know, it would align a lot of perspectives. How would it happen? Because uh, if he does vasectomy, there will be no uh, uh, kind of, you know, threat of future procreation. And uh, uh, at the same time, their mutual lives would continue unabated. Uh, and at the same time, uh, they can marry and settle down. No problem in that. And what Ramani also very jocularly says, it is also in the national interest. But what is... Uh, ultimately not accepted by the school teacher is this that but you were a man you should have procreated you know why did you make the sacrifice for the needy so this is a society there's this very heteropatriarchal capitalistic society is a society that perhaps does not really appreciate love it, it does not really want a situation where people would uh, leave alone love, have a, an atmosphere of friendship, you know, an, an atmosphere of a comradeship budding uh, amongst themselves. You know, they would always be critical of what people don't have. You know? See, I have uh, an academic job and you don't have one. Uh, I have a family and you don't have one. I have a Routledge publication and you don't have one. Well, the last one was just a, a fun rejoinder. But anyway, like it, it's all based on a series of uh, kind of you know haves and have nots by which uh, people try to judge uh, the other person, or uh, you know, irrespective of the fact that we all belong to different uh, standpoints in society. You know, we we all have different issues that uh, that that we are having to deal with, and we have different demons in our life that we are having to fight. So everybody is not fighting the same story. You know, people have uh, differential choices. And uh, this is also important that last but not the least uh, is a theme which I find is rather missed out by most critics, is the fact that what about the whole idea of fantasy? What about the whole idea of imagination? What about the, uh, what, what is the role of, you know, uh, dreams in our lives? And most importantly, where exactly do we draw a demarcating line between dreams and delusions? Because you see, if you have a dream, then people will tell you that, uh, oh, you are being delusional, that, that, that will not happen. This is, this is just a, uh, kind of, you know, uh, 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 a, a blunderbuss on your side. This is basically a, a wish which is not going to come true. This is a fabrication. Uh, and, and they're not going to believe your story that you can actually do that. So this uh, edifice of fiction in our lives, you know, what is, the, what is the value of fiction in our lives? And do we dismiss any fictive possibility as a non-existent possibility, you know, like uh, is, is fiction uh, only a phantasmagoric uh, presence in our lives or, or is it an extension of reality? What is the real real? This is something that perhaps uh, Rushdie tries to kind of, you know, 
deliberately uh, confuse a little bit because this gap between reality and illusion, which was a Shakespearean preoccupation as well, you know that, uh, and, and this difference between dream and delusion is not left very clearly stated. There, are, there is a, a kind of you know, reader response uh, thrown at the end. There is a, a hermeneutical uh, postmodern uh, openness. Uh, you know, there, there is a proliferation of uh, readings that can be uh, possibly emanated from the story because uh, it is true that uh, this young man, this, this otherwise very good but naive uh, in certain ways, because he, he's broad hearted as well. And uh, a man who hasn't really any formal education like the school teacher has not done any quote unquote respectable job. And yet he has taken decisions which is largely uh, his, uh, based on his individual judgment of the state of things. And, and uh, eventually uh, there is this entire question that has he done all of this uh, excuse me. Has he done all of this uh, for the sake of the free radio that he uh, hoped that he would get after the vasectomy was done? Because there was this initial uh, idea that the government, the central government, was giving a free radio transistor to every uh, person who was being vasectomized. And uh, that was as a kind of a contributory gift uh, by the government to the people. And uh, mind you, we are talking about a pre-digital India. Uh, we are talking about a time when the visual cultures were not popular yet. You know, the, the, the televisions had not yet arrived. Uh, my immediate college students will not understand that kind of a time unless you see it in pictures that we had uh, black and white televisions, then we had a Western uh, color television. And then, of course, we had, uh, you know, the post-globalization, all the opening up of the multiple TV channels all over the world. So the world was in increasingly coming to our uh, drawing rooms. And, and that was a major change in our uh, outlook to the world. But at, at that point of time, the radio was the basic idea of communication. But then once again, there is this question that we all listen to the news. And we all uh, look up for information. How much information is statistical and how much of that information is propagandist? You know, sometimes I might want to give you an information to deliberately color your opinion. I wouldn't give you an information to make you think for yourself. You know, like I, I listen to a particular news channel and they give me an information, which I know they are saying it from the perspective of this political party. But when I listen to the same news from different uh, news channels, I get to understand what's really happening. So perhaps it is this uh, sense of you know, meta-narratives all around us. If we collectively assemble the meta-narratives, can we get a bigger picture? I'm still not saying that if we gather all the meta-narratives together, we will have the grand narrative. The, the very idea of a grand narrative is, is dismantled uh, in this context because there is no the truth out there. But what I'm trying to say is this, that if we get out of our biases for people and things, and if we stop being prejudiced and judgmental, and if we try to embrace change, if we try to uh, upgrade ourselves the way we upgrade the apps of our uh, cell phones, um, maybe uh, we will have more uh, easier lives. So we will have easier lives. We will have more congenial lives. Uh, we will have more compatibility with the different kinds of people who live with us and in and around us. So, so that is uh, something which is really championed because uh, as, as Rajdi keeps on telling in, in different works, that uh, the role of the imagination uh, is, is, is definitely very proactive. And uh, it, it really doesn't harm much if there is a cut and mix to everything, including identity. You know, like having a heterogeneous identity 
doesn't make you polluted it it actually makes you uh, more multiculturally rich and dynamic and that is one of the reasons why because of this post truth politicization of everything today we have uh, a threat to multiculturalism as well because we simply refuse to get out of the little boxes that we have created for ourselves and so there is this imperative to you know get out of uh, the stereotypes that we have been uh, feeding uh, to ourselves for a very long time so any kind of othering uh, by which we tend to have exclusionary processes in life is something not to be supported you know something which is perhaps fallacious and i i also uh, am suddenly reminded of the fact that uh, imaginary homelands was already published by this time so uh, at a time at a point of time when rashti was looking beyond the frontiers or the boundaries of nation states he was also perhaps trying to look beyond the boundaries of the individual mind that uh, the boundaries that keep us claustrophobic and uh, hegemonized and hide bound in particular uh, identity zones that are perhaps not really fully us and of course there is this whole idea about the relation between the government and the and and its uh, you know ordinary population you know what role does the government have should the government only dictate terms and conditions should the government only say what is right and what is wrong uh, and tell the people this is what you have to do or should the government also prepare its people you know like we have had universal uh, suffrage from a very uh, you know from the inception of the nation itself like ever since the nation became independent we have been uh, having uh, the voting processes continued uh, for a long time and at the same time uh, we have uh, except the emergency period of course when everything was suspended uh, so uh, there is this question that whether our people are truly uh, assured of everything whether there is faith in the government whether there is people's participation in the government and that can only happen when we start that at the familial level at the basic level of the human family or if we go a little beyond that at the basic level of our community or immediate community how much are we really open about each other i will not talk to you because i have heard something bad about you from somebody else and i am kind of you know prejudiced as uh, darcy is or or elizabeth is Uh, at the very start of pride and prejudice that's not going to work in in today's context you have to open up and you have to meet and uh, mix people uh, in 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 the right way and you have to stop spreading the cobra poison as as the woman says that which basically means that you have to uh, actually stop uh, your gossip mongering because uh, though you are a respectable school teacher you have not really risen above uh, the you know basic village gossip that takes place uh, around the water collection area so yes the woman is 10 years older than the man uh, the woman is ha- has a, ha- had already married once she is a widow now she has uh, children but that doesn't discredit the fact that she is uh, an individual and she is an individual free to make her choices uh the radio is of course the agency of propaganda and uh, we will have a lot of propaganda in our life but what we choose and what we not choose uh, what we do not choose is entirely our own choosing but what is most important is look at the word free inside the free radio it's perhaps ultimately a question of freedom it's per- perhaps ultimately a question of autonomy it is perhaps ultimately a question of decision making and everything that is uh, you know uh, dictated from exterior agencies whoever that agency is whether it's a school teacher or the government itself uh, has definitely uh, an impact on us but that is not more than the individual sense of judgment that we all have the indi- individual sense of analysis and decision making that uh, is there uh, within all of us and our very reasoning of things uh, should be in keeping with uh, the open minds uh, that we should all have and which can only happen if we give felicity to our imagination uh, to our basic human selves so that is uh, all that i have and uh, 
I do not think that uh, this predilection for fantasies is is something that Rajdi castigates, uh, and not something definitely that I would want to castigate either. So with that, I come to a close, and I hand over uh, the forum to Mir. Mir, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you, sir, uh, for such uh, insightful analysis of this text. You have begun with Salman Rushdie. You have contextualized him. Uh, you have also talked about the background of uh, 1984. I mean, emergency and how this text is written at the pinnacle of success of uh, Rushdie's career. And you have also touched upon almost every aspect of identitarian politics or the question of identity that is revealed in the text. So thank you once again. Now we'll uh, move to the Q&A session. And so far, I can see that there are a couple of questions from our students. And so I'll yeah. project one by one on the screen. And we'll be very happy if you give the answer. First question is sure. by uh, Ayan Odhikari. And the question is, why the title mentions radio in the story? What does it imply? Yeah, uh, well, of course, uh, the title of the story basically has a literal implication. And it also has a, a metaphorical implication. Literally speaking, basically, as I told you, that there was this uh, initial announcement that uh, the radio as, a, as an incentive, as a free gift, would be uh, given to the people, the men who were vasectomized. Now, of course, as we all know that uh, we as Indians, we have uh, a big uh, fascination for free gifts. You know, like what comes, so if you buy this from the supermarket, this is what you get as free. So we all love to have freebies uh, in our lives. Uh, we love to inherit things instead of working hard to get them. Uh, and, and that is something which is definitely there. That was basically to coax people to kind of, you know, get vasectomized because the radio transistor was a kind of a status symbol or a luxury item to have in those days as well. Uh, and, and of course, as you can understand that, uh, rich people had gramophones and all that, but for the poor to have a, a radio uh, and you to hold it between your hands or within your palm was something to possess, you know, in, in, in that way. So there was this lucrative element in the radio. And uh, metaphorically, it also talks about the basic idea of propaganda. Though these white caravan bands were going from village to village and they were doing the necessary job, but people had to be given information as well. And uh, during those days, you know, like uh, the radio communication through Akashvani and many other, you know, like uh, government forums, uh, definitely uh, had a lot to say about the official standpoint, you know, what the government was endorsing at that uh, point of time. And what the government was endorsing at that point of time was very, very important because, uh, mind you, this was the emergency. And uh, during the emergency, you know, civil liberties are suspended and, uh, you know, there, there is no uh, electoral uh, investment um, at the same time. Elections are not held. And so the people are anxiously looking forward to what the government is doing. And they know that in India where power politics plays a role in everything, uh, the common people will not really have a say in, 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 in anything major. So the common people would have to follow what the you know, government is uh, saying and doing. And uh, this is the idea where uh, the radio becomes an important element. I also have this feeling that uh, this is, of course, uh, an independent reading, that uh, the school teacher imagines that Ramani is kind of about to lose his manhood by falling into the into a trap with this woman, and uh, by you know like uh, getting vasectomized, he is almost kind of uh, going to be castrated. So so he would be like a a, a castrated bull. Uh, a castrated man is almost uh, metaphorically speaking a nomad in that sense. So the radio is a kind of a metaphorical substitution of this loss. The question that comes up is this, that is 
this substitution really worth it would you like to forego of your manhood by getting a radio uh, this is uh, uh, of course <laughs> we know that this is not a question at all it's it's very humorously predicated but at the same time i think that uh, despite the jocular element uh, in this remark there is this idea that uh, the school teacher finds it rather stupid that ramani should vasectomize himself and uh, have his you know ear uh, have his uh, palm over his ear uh, and that to imagining that the radio is there and getting to hear invisible frequencies which are not there so there is a comical build up because uh, he of course never gets that free radio but what is interesting is this that there there is a series of uh, turn of events uh, which indicate that perhaps ramani uh, does not get a very uh, you know tarnished uh, future for himself so uh, this this very idea where propaganda and freedom freedom to think freedom to imagine freedom to choose and on the other hand propaganda which tells you what to do what is right what you should do the haves and the have nots the moral science lectures these two are juxtaposed together so the title is short but it is very powerful and very significantly appropriate in this context thank you sir yes. uh, next question is by pooja das and the question is what is the purpose of naswandi or vasectomy in the story what is it yeah yeah uh, well uh, i think that you know to put it very simply it is this that uh, the government uh, the central government at that point of time did not really perceive india's burgeoning population as a human resource you know like these days we have different indexes and paradigms of evaluation so these days we treat a population force as a human resource uh, and we want to train that population and we want to uh, you know make it suitably employed and we want to make it an employable workforce these days but in those days it was felt that with a limited public exchequer uh, an over populated nation will have several pro uh, uh, problems to face in due course of time so uh, the government felt that they must do something drastic in order to control population and uh, this was largely aimed at uh, uh, due at, at the more rural you know sectors uh, in villages and all that because uh, that's where the government felt that people did not really understand the utility of family planning now of course as we all know that uh, down the line uh, when you know different governments had come after that during the 80s and uh, after the liberalization era of the 90s and all that it it led to several policies uh, there was one policy that came after that hum do hamare do so basically means a family should compose of four people that was the then idea of a nuclear family husband wife and two children no more children but if you look at uh, our grandparents generation you would find that uh, a four child or a five child norm in almost every family was not really much of an aberration now of course the question comes that you know who is the government to kind of uh, put a ceiling on 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 something or some some someone's individual choices but then of course the government felt that it would be necessary and they exercised this policy for whatever be the reasons and then came the one child norm that you know like uh, every couple should have only one child and uh, we almost adopted the 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 state vision of china but after that and even in the post millennial uh, situation i find something which is even more interesting that it is absolutely okay if you do not marry and if you do not have children or if you marry and choose not to have children or if you want to be the uh, parent of i'm not using the term father and mother i don't support that if you uh, if you want to be the parent of an adopted child you you take up a child for adoption that is also not frowned upon provided you have the legal formalities done or for that matter you want to be the parent of a tree or an animal or a plant even that is good provided you are a good parent you are parenting uh, 
uh, the uh, entity well, uh, then uh, even that is done. So, so we have, uh, in many different you know situations, stopped being very hyper judgmental. But then once again, at what kind of population are we looking? In in more uh, you know uh, conservative sections of the society, uh, even today, you know, marriage and procreation are are big time things. So if you marry, uh, you need to have a child. If you have a son, then you will automatically wish for a daughter. If you have a daughter, you wish for a son. So we do not. Uh, and if you if you uh, wish for, uh, if you have one son, you seek another son. So there is no end to seeking like this. You know, like and and people often confuse uh, the capacities of people based on their gender, as if like boys can do this, girls can't do this. Or a girl can do this, a boy can't do this. These are all, you know, conservative stereotypes that I think uh, appears to be comical in this situation. But as I mentioned earlier, has several, uh, you know, serious undertones as well. So uh, vasectomy was this procedure by which uh, the conception of uh, a new child was prevented. This surgery or surgical procedure was. Uh, operated on the man, by which the man could lead an active sexual life, but would not have had uh, babies, would not inseminate a woman, uh, so to say. So, uh, yes, recreative sexual behavior was possible, but procreative sexual behavior was uh, kind of, you know, uh, terminated. Uh, and, and this uh, was done with such uh, rigidity and uh, it was done at such a quick pace that it put a lot of uh, mistrust and fear in the minds of the common people that the government was now after they had eaten up our lives they were now trying to tamper with our sexual identities they were now trying to uh, curb uh, our uh, you know freedom and uh, one thing if I might say uh, should not appear as sedition but uh, if I might just point out that uh, large sections of the Hindu population also felt that uh, the Congress government, which was uh, basically, uh, you know, it, it basically constituted of uh, non-Hindu elites, were trying to tamper with the Indian population. This idea was also there. So yes, this this uh, the good side of family planning was totally, uh, you know, ignored, and there was a lot of hush hush, uh, you know, gossipy discussion about what the government was trying to do, what where it's long-term plans, so on and so forth. But basically, vasectomy is a, it's a simple procedure. It doesn't harm any individual. It only uh, results in limited uh, smaller families, and which is also good in, in, in a major way, and, and especially in the context of a country like India and China. Uh, well, uh, it, it has its own utilities. But the whole uh, issue is earning confidence, you know, Ramani has to tell this to the school teacher. The school teacher has to understand it and tell it to others. The government has to make the people understand. So there is an element of participatory behavior. There is an element of a conversational exchange. Uh, you can't just impose something uh, from the top and accept that everybody would support it. So uh, there is this idea that how do we make this interactive felicity possible? That is what the you know whole procedure is all about. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. The next question is by Miras Pagali, and he said, "Please, uh, sir, please clear the concept of specialization and what's the relationship between realistic and magical quotes in 20th century writing." Uh, I do not get the first part of the question, but. Uh, if I am not wrong, uh, I think that, you know, like, uh, if I might very simply, in very simplistic terms, explain uh, what I was trying to say is this, that there is a locatedness in Rajdi's writings. So, of course, it does have a socio-cultural location. But uh, there is also a fabulation of the entire thing. You know, the, the text also emerges as a fabula, as a as an idealistic text of expectations which are built up and led to a, a sort of a climax. And uh, I feel that uh, in this context, uh, you know, what is, uh, what is possible and what, is, what we consider as 
impossible. Uh, what is uh, present and what is the domain of the future? Uh, what is, uh, as I said, what is desire and what is delusion? These things are brought to a complex state of juxtaposition. You know, both entities are placed side by side and there is a lot of interfusions going on as well. So that complicates the essence of possibilities. You know, the basic task of uh, intimacy, which is human-human intimacy or an intimacy with your own self, uh, an intimate relation with the government, where I feel that the government is mine, the government thinks about my welfare, the government considers every, every policy decision in terms of a welfare state decision. It, it is not a plutocratic government. It's not a government that thinks only about a couple of elite people. Uh, if I have this participatory idea uh, in my personal life and in my public life, I would definitely be close to those people. You know, like uh, that, that person can be my spouse or my girlfriend or my daughter or uh, somebody to whom I am officially, uh, you know, uh, kind of intimate with. It can be a friend. It can be a colleague. So this idea of intimacy is not something which uh, can be uh, regimented in terms of, you know, uh, an, an, an inspectory behavior, you know, or, or, a, or a very sensorial behavior. Uh, because uh, you, you must understand that censorship basically comes when, when we want to curb a, a sense of expression. That is when, where censorship basically comes. That's what happened to Rajdi after fatwa. You can't say that. Why did you say that? That is not right. That is uh, blasphemy. And he had to go on a hiding and all that. And if you remember after the fatwa, when he had written the uh, Harun and the Sea of Stories, then uh, he was, uh, the, the, the man was telling his son uh, that, uh, I'm sorry, son, the, uh, the cruel caliph had turned the waters of storytelling off. Okay, like, so storytelling is like a flow. He had shut the water tap, and so the flow is not now coming because uh, my narrative is not, uh, I'm having to filter my thoughts uh, and, and then say everything. But if this filtration is uh, always done, then we possibly do not have that uh, sense of connecting our so-called uh, literal selves with our uh, fantastical planes. You know, that's where the whole trope of magic realism would also come into operation. And uh, a story like this makes that possible because it, it tends to connect history with the very idea of uh, historicizing it to a possible uh, situation. If you look at Midnight's Children, for instance, you would see that Salim Sinai has a history. Okay, like he has been swapped and of course you find that he has come to uh, a, re, uh, a practical situation in which he was not born initially. But then uh, there is also that sense of idea that had things not happened this way, what would it have, have happened in the first place? So what should have been the destiny of India and, and what we have come to? I still believe that India has every possibility of becoming a superpower someday becoming uh, a, a very progressive nation in every sense of the term. But maybe in order to do that, we have to first examine our, our attitudes, our individual attitudes, our family values, our sense of, you know, uh, th th this whole culture of prohibition and shame has to go. And we have to be more open and honest and true to ourselves. And only perhaps then all the other political channels and cultural channels and social forums would also open up uh, in, in very proper ways. So that's the way I think about it. Thank you, sir. We have uh, yeah. uh, two I three understand. more questions. <laughs> please, 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 go ahead. No problem. Okay, okay. thank you so much, sir. Uh, we have the next question is from Bunishika Maiti, and she asks the question, how does, uh, how the East-West dichotomy revealed in the story? Uh, well, uh, you see, uh, that's very interesting because uh, the other stories in the sequence, like let's say there is a story called Yorick uh, and, and there is a story called uh, 
Columbus, Christopher Columbus and uh, Isabella make love. So there are senses uh, and, and contexts. There are texts and, you know, contextual situations where there is a, a, a sense of, you know, playing with history uh, or, or playing with those aspects of history which do not really find mention in the textbooks. Uh, like, for instance, uh, in Isabella and Columbus' story, there is this idea that Isabella was the uh, dominant uh, you know, queen of Spain at that point of time. She was the imperial head. And her husband, Frederick, was, was basically seen as a whim. Um, and uh, Columbus, in order to get the uh, you know, sanction of fleets and the investment, uh, actually pleased Isabella on bed. Uh, in bed, and and that's how you know he got to have the favors. Now, whether that was true or not is a different thing. But uh, the fact is this: that there is this sense of uh, a literal and a metaphorical play with uh, history as well. But as far as your question is concerned, East West, please note the comma in in between. So it is not that uh, it's it's not really always that. Uh, as we go by, you know, Rudyard Kipling's statement that East is the East and West is West and never shall the twain meet. Uh, in my PhD dissertation also, I have this uh, basic, you know, quotational praxis where I begin by saying that the twain shall meet, you know, and there are many possibilities of doing that by which there is this East-West interaction uh, or, or the, the very edifices of Orientalism and Occidentalism uh, lose their individual standpoints, they collapse, and they come together in, in many different ways. In this story, specifically in this story, uh, the Western paradigm is uh, not directly present. It is present through the intrusion of the vasectomy uh, idea. You know, like the, that, that's basically a, a scientific uh, and a medical uh, intervention. And of course, that idea also comes from the West, and we incorporate that, and we see that as necessary in the Indian context. By we, I mean the then uh, central government, the Congress government. They felt it as uh, important, and they introduced, and uh, they wanted to introduce it to uh, the in, in the Indian context. But the Indian uh, people felt that as alien. You know, they felt that that is a, a foreign culture invasion. And that is not really us. We as Indians, we should be happy in having as many babies as we want. And, uh, and, and I think in the Indian context, please uh, correct me if I am wrong, but uh, plain recreative sexual behavior is usually frowned upon. But, uh, you know, uh, behavior, sexual behavior, which is procreative, is always wanted. So you are supposed to remain... Uh, once again, correct me if I'm wrong, you are supposed to be completely clean-minded and brahmachari and, uh, for 25 years of your life. And suddenly when you get married, overnight you are supposed to turn into a horny beast. Now, this is, this is definitely a very uh, wrong standpoint because uh, that also uh, kind of puts a slur on every individual. I will tell you a personal anecdote. After my own marriage, there was a, uh, a, a man, an elderly man, who called me up for an official information. And then he said that, uh, oh, you're still awake at 11 at night. I said, no, what were you expecting? Well, I thought that and dot, dot, dot. So <laughs> that's the thing that, you know, like there is always this idea that a married man should be having, uh, indulging in sexual activity 24-7. That's not the case. You know, we all have different work to do. We have official formalities, so on and so forth. And so we, we do not understand which is the public domain, which is the personal domain. We do not give people spaces. We do not respect their privacy. And uh, we do not understand the basic paradigms of, you know, uh, uh, interpersonal behavior. So that is something that I think the government was also like, a, a, you know, a foreign uh, agent trying to penetrate into this Indian system, uh, this Indian ethos without really spending much time in assuring the people. You know, it, it was definitely done, but this 
uh, as Sanjay Gandhi always did with most of his policies, there was always an overnight expediency uh, of everything, uh, which is a good thing also because he was trying to get things done uh, uh, as rapidly as possible. I'm not criticizing the government standpoint entirely, but I'm also not in favor of this uh, idea that things uh, had to be imposed uh, forcibly. This forced sterilization by which this, uh, you know, armed band youths, they were coaxing people and beating people and literally kind of, you know, uh, abducting people to the caravan vans. That was also a perhaps mercenary way of doing the whole thing. A lot of, uh, you know, education and taking people into their confidence was necessary, which perhaps did not happen at that point. Yeah. Right. Uh, next question is by Titi Sorongi, and she asked, uh, "What is the symbolic significance of radio?" I think, I think it's both the question. Yeah. Exactly. The, question. Uh, the next question is by Dipankar De, and he asked the question: "Is it a story about gender bias of the Indian society?" Definitely, it is. You know, like it is. It is majorly uh, predicated on. Uh, you know, massive gender biases and not just gender bias, I would say that gender stereotypes as well. That, you know, like young Ramani, you are a young man. So you are now supposed to marry a very eligible uh, young woman. And of course, as you all know, the idea of virginity and uh, the pure bride and so on and so forth comes into the picture here. And you are supposed to start a life of sexual adventure and you're supposed to create your own babies. What is it that you are doing with uh, an, uh, a, a, a young widow who was someone else's wife and who is not the ideal wife and who has uh, you know, her own baby? So this segregational behavior, you know, this, this idea that what is mine is mine and even my spouse is uh, one of my possessions, you know, like uh, I have this very uh, capitalistic, uh, uh, hyper-capitalistic orientation to everything, so much so that even people are seen as commercial products. Uh, that is uh, very lamentable. And uh, gender stereotypes, I think I have mentioned uh, in the course of my lecture earlier, that uh, this, this very idea that she is a widow, uh, as if that was her own choosing, becoming a widow was not her choosing. Uh, and then she was a thief's wife. She did not tell her uh, husband to steal. She would have loved it if her husband would have done an honorable job and uh, be become a breadwinner in the true sense of the term. But that did not happen. Uh, in, the, uh, in the mythological context, we never say that Ratnakar's parents were also Dekons. We never say that. So why should we say that Ramani's wife, why should we describe Ramani's wife as the thief's widow. Why should a, a proper name be absent uh, from her uh, very definitional parlance? In the, the, the Duchess of Malfi as well, I, I find that problem. Lusty widow, young widow, why these terms? You know, uh, Is she not something beyond that as well? Does she not have a personal identity of her own? So there is definitely uh, a, a lack of gender balance there is a lack of gender neutrality. There is a lack of, you know, uh, gender equality. Uh, it is tremendously uh, lopsided when it comes to the gender equation. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and the last question, I think, and it is by Krishna Gopal Das, and he has asked that how the characters of Ram and Sita related with the character of Ramani and Widow Woman. So, uh, see, uh, that was just a passing mention, and don't ask me to do, dwell on that more and more because uh, that's a that's that's a question I would like to avoid if possible. But since you have asked it, uh, let me just tell you this: that you must remember one thing. Uh, there are some names, you know, in the uh, Indian context. They're very popular names. Okay, like for instance, we have seen in R K Narayan's The Guide. Raju is actually a very popular name. A lot of people have names and a lot of people like to keep Raju as a pet name also or a, a sort of a pseudonym also. It's a very common so to say. And in that sense also, uh, Ram is uh, a very you know, a popular name in, in the Indian context. People 
uh, have a deferential attitude to that. I'm not going into the political aspect of the interpretation of uh, this uh, idea. But what I'm trying to get to, the cultural aspect rather, is the fact that uh, Ramani has been shortened to Ram on uh, one or two occasions in the text. And there is uh, this very idea that uh, there is a sense of honor. There is a sense of, uh, there, there is a sense of mythological association and respect for that name. Now, you see, like if I go by the story, if I leave alone the mythology and all that, if I go by the simple story, then there is this idea that Ram was a very honorable king. He cared a lot for his subjects. And there is that idea of the Ram Rajya and everything, which is supposed to be uh, bring about a lot of peace and prosperity to the land. So quite obviously, if you accept that cultural idea and you apply the context of uh, a character like Ram or Ramani to the context of a, a woman who is widowed, was a thief's wife, has five children, is 10 years older than him, it is too much for uh, uh, the, the school teacher to accept, you know, like uh, this is something that uh, he does not accept at all. But once again, the question is, whom we should love? Why do we love them? Who loves us? Why do they love us? Can you really answer these questions uh, in very straightforward terms? You can't. You know, love is not really always uh, calculated and decided upon. Uh, marriages, of course, yeah, he, he could have chosen not to marry that woman. And in fact, the woman had herself mentioned that I never asked him to marry me. In fact, I told him not to marry me. She, she mentions that because you should marry someone who will give your own children. I don't want a life of deprivation for you. But Ramani says that I chose to marry her and get vasectomized because it worked the whole situation the best. You know, we could be together. We already have children. There are five children. So what if they are not biologically mine? They're still my children if I marry her. Okay. And uh, we can raise a happy family. We can be together. And we can also listen to the state. Everything works out perfectly well. Imagine this is a rickshaw puller, you know, a man who has no formal degrees, uh, so to speak of. He is telling you this. And this is not just the voice of reason. This is the voice of humanity. This is the voice of uh, goodness, you know, benevolence. This is the, the, the voice of truth, which is also speaking. And, and, and do we think that we should castigate this voice? Definitely not. So that's my entire take on, on the character of Ramani. And I feel that uh, if we are missing out on that, then we are missing out on something very major. So thank yes. you. Uh, thank you once again, Dr. Paul. Uh, for your kind and valuable time. It is a thoroughgoing, engaging talk. Our students are immensely benefited with your talk. So thank you. Uh, wish you a happy and safe stay. And uh, I wish that in future, whenever we'll need you, we'll get you as a uh, Surely. Surely. Thank you. Surely, Neil. Nice thank you so much. Thank you. thank you very much. Pleasure was all mine.